Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jennifer Aguinaldo. I'm the energy and technology editor of uh, NEED. I'm moderating this afternoon's panel on the PPP um, um, use in the water and electricity infrastructure across the region. Um, uh, so the PPP model has been used for procuring projects um, in the region since the early 1990s. And in the past few years, we've seen some of the largest and most aggressively priced independent water projects and renewable energy projects being awarded as well. Um, the purpose of this panel would be to answer two questions. First, we want to shed light in terms of how the current crisis arising from the low uh, oil prices and COVID-19 pandemic is affecting these projects, whether the projects on the pipeline, construction, under construction or operational projects, as well as um, to understand what are the options for projects, for contracted capacities that are coming out of contract. We've seen um, the first IPP in Oman this year, for instance, being transferred to the government. And I want to find out um, the thoughts of our speakers um, this afternoon. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are joined by six expert panelists that represent the entire spectrum of the power and water sector in the region. I'll start by introducing uh, our first panelist uh, from Abu Dhabi. We have John Franklin Hurst. Capacity Procurement Director, Emirates Water and Electricity Company. John? Oh, good afternoon, everybody. Very pleased to be on this panel discussion. Uh, uh, my name's John Hurst. Uh, I'm the uh, Director for uh, Capacity Procurement for Electricity and Water uh, for the region. Um, and as you know, AWEC is responsible for the planning of uh, future capacity to purchase the supply of water and electricity on a PPP basis. Thank you, Thank you John. Um, our next panel is from Bahrain. Um, Peter Naylor, uh, Operators Representative and General Manager, Mohara Wastewater Services Company. Peter. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, yes, uh, Pete Naylor, I'm the General Manager and Operator Representative for Maharic Wastewater Services Company. Um, we're the operators of the Maharic um, Sewage Treatment Scheme in Bahrain. The concession runs from, um, operating concession from 2014 to 2040. So we're currently in year seven, and it's my job to manage the delivery of wastewater services to the asset owner, which is the Maharic uh, Sewage Company and on to the ultimate client, uh, the Ministry of Works in, in Bahrain. Thank you, Peter. And from Seoul, um, Russell Reed is joining us. He's the General Manager, Industrial and Environment Division of Samsung Engineering. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, uh, Jennifer, panelists, and, and everybody in the audience. So, so um, I'm, I'm, I'm working for Samsung Engineering, um, and, and if you know Samsung, they're, they're sort of best known as a, a, a EPC contractor in the hydrocarbon industry, uh, but, but they're also a major industrial contractor. And, and in fact, probably half our work we do is, is building uh, sort of turnkey facilities for Samsung Display, Samsung Electronics, Samsung Semiconductors, etc. Uh, and as part of that, we, we, we have a sort of two to three really two to three billion dollar a year uh, in environmental business where, where we build um, all the ultra pure water facilities for the Samsung companies, all of their sort of solid waste, air waste treatment systems. And, and it's a little bit under the radar, but we're, we're probably sort of by, by sort of size of plants, what, one, one of the biggest sort of water contractors um, in, in, in the world. Um, in, in addition to sort of the, the industrial plants, we, we also build uh, municipal treatment plants, and 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 sort of and run sort of concession projects in Korea um, and overseas. Uh, and my my role is primarily in in the sort of. Um, bidding of new projects and, and looking after the existing concessions uh, in, in Korea and overseas. 
Interesting. Uh, thanks, Russell. Um, um, we now go to Saudi Arabia. We're joined by Zamil Al Zamil, Director for Interface Management of Kidea. A few words from Zamil. Uh, hi, Jenny, and good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm Zamil Al Zamil, Interface Director at Kidea Investment Company. Uh, currently, uh, I'm in the role. Uh, we are finalizing uh, a bidding process uh, of uh, utility privatization to provide uh, all the utilities to be supplied uh, for the geographic area of uh, Kidia, which uh, represents almost one third of, of, of Riyadh. Uh, so it, it's a significant geographic area that uh, is going to the approach of privatizing, privatizing all the utilities supplied to the residents and the commercial uh, and entertainment uh, assets within Kitiya. Uh, and now we are in the final uh, stages of uh, awarding the uh, uh, privatization uh, deal with, with uh, one of the bidding investors. Indeed, indeed, all the best in that. Uh, and we move on to the side of the fence. We have Anil Vichaya Chandran. He is the director for acquisitions and project finance at Aqua Power. Anil. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, part of the acquisitions and project finance team within Aqua Power, uh, and we kind of uh, we be a part of the house team. Uh, uh, Sorry, Anil, we can't hear you well. Um, right. Yeah, is this a bit better? Yes, this is be that's better. Thank you. So I am part of the acquisitions and project finance team. Uh, for a um, yeah, on a very broad based group. Uh, sure, sure. And now we move to the last but not least, of course, our final panelist is David Molshead. He is a senior counselor at UK Export Finance, and he will be uh, sharing a few words using a PowerPoint presentation, I would suppose. Hi, David. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, um, as Jennifer said, I'm Senior Counselor, UK Export Finance, and our team is responsible for originating export finance transaction across the EMEA region. And that's the Middle East, less Egypt, plus Afghanistan and Pakistan. As some of you might not be familiar with UK Export Finance, I'd like to give you a brief introduction through a couple of slides. Uh, slide on, please. Um, UK Export Finance was uh, founded in 1999 as the oldest export credit agency in the world, celebrating its centenary last year. Uh, UK Export Finance is part of the Department of International Trade and works under a mandate which is granted by Her Majesty's Treasury. So any guarantees that we issue carries the full faith and credit of the UK government. We work in partnership with over 70 commercial lenders and private insurers. and uh, we help UK exporters so to fulfil contracts and to get paid for contracts. Uh, the support that we provide for overseas buyers, which is more relevant for this audience, we are looking to provide finance to overseas buyers of UK goods and services so the UK exporters offering can be more attractive. In effect, the overseas buyers are provided with long-term facilities with competitive terms so they can make payments which contain the minimum eligible amount of UK content. In the recent past, the Middle East has been by far a most active region in terms of values of loans that we have provided to buyers. The motivation for UK export is UK export support is to ensure that no buyer. <laughs> Um, sorry, I think we've just lost David. Um, I think we can go back to him and um, a bit later when his, his connection is all right. David, do let us know when you're back in the session. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, we're seeking to answer two key, there will be two key themes for this final discussion. And I'm going to ask, I'm going to Russell uh, read first and ask you the first question. Um, can you paint us a picture in terms of 
what the current crisis has 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 affected um, projects and and in your business basically in briefly. Uh, on on the sort of corona crisis yes well, well i guess um obviously you know we're we're in we're in a sort of a a, a major uh, a sort of a, a major recession um or, or not not a recession we're in a sort of very much a global downturn at the moment uh, i i think no one knows sort of how long it, it's going to go on or or how how deep um it is going to get probably for most of us in the infrastructure business um, which is a sort of very long-term business the slowdown has been perhaps a little on on the slow side so we, we obviously have a number of projects that are ongoing um, so so th th there hasn't been such a major impact to the to sort of ongoing projects so, some delays in sort of getting equipment out and another thing uh, but what, what what we're really seeing is is a sort of slowdown in 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 projects being bid and a new a new projects sort of coming in. Right, and 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 is is there um, is there a trend in terms of pricing coming down, or is 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 um, in terms of new projects? Um, are you seeing um, prices being? Uh, uh, downward pressure on prices um, as a result of, of of this crisis and low prices. Um, at, at, at the moment, be, because because there's so few new projects coming in, I, I, I think it's impossible to sort of um, to, to sort of to, to say anything about where where prices are going. Uh, I, I think it's perhaps clear to say that 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 certainly on, on the contractor side people are getting hungrier. Right, okay, people are getting hungrier. Let me go to John. Um, so from EWEC, EWEC has a, um, a pipeline of projects. So this is about to close um, uh, um, Aldafra solar power. Um, you've just closed, uh, construction has started on Fujaira F3 as well. Um, presumably, uh, as what we've seen um, in, in other markets, there has been some slowdown in terms of from um, demand and um, electricity demand in that case. How is this impacting um, EWEX pipeline of projects, John? Well, as you mentioned, we're maintaining business as usual. We continue. Oh, we can't hear you well, John. Can I, is that better? That's better. Is that better? All right, I'll come a bit closer. So it's business as usual here at, at EWET. We, as you said, we're continuing the financial close on DAFRA, the second uh, PV project. Uh, uh, with uh, the, the winning bidder, uh, EDF from Jinko, and we should be able to close that within the next month to six weeks. Uh, pricing has been maintained. Um, uh, you know, it was one of the, the lowest at the time of bid opening of uh, 1.35 cent per kilowatt hour which was a, a world low, so we were delighted to see that result. And uh, we're, we're continuing. Um, EPC is prepared to mobilize, so uh, that's good. From the operation and maintenance side of the existing generation fleet, right. um, you've seen there's not been major implications, no blackouts or power or water shortages whatsoever. So all of the IWPPs have performed amazingly well over this very difficult period. Looking forward to the future, <clears throat> we're still monitoring what the change in demand is. And to begin with, actual demand through the summer was higher than we were forecasting and now uh, we're seeing that maybe it could be a slight shock so our uh, program of what we're going to do for the future is dependent on the next few months 
and how much longer um, the impact of COVID is going to take place. So uh, we're continuing with our, our present developments of the waste to energy projects. Um, as you probably know, we've appointed advisors for that and we're working hard and we'll be issuing an RFP uh, in the first half of next year, I would think. Okay, so that's, it does sound like business as usual in the sense that, but you still have to look and wait, uh, scan away in terms of what's going to be the trend in terms of um, demand over the next couple of months. Is that right? Of course, the yes. WTE is happening um, um, yeah. um, given that it's one, 119 megawatts together, but for the next TV and the next reverse, uh, next RO plan, um, are we? Are you saying we'll, we'll wait a little bit more? Is that? Um, we're, we're, the RO plant, um, we're, we're, we're still looking at very seriously. Um, we would, at this moment, we're, we're still working on it. As I said, you need to see what the impact of the second wave of COVID is. Okay, thank you very much, John. Anil, um, for your end of the business, um, is, is it business as usual? Um, yeah, so the, I think we can kind of split it into three. That means there, there was a priority work, um, which had, of course, close out the that we have worked for. Uh, Anil, we can't hear you well. Uh, hello. Is this a yeah. bit better? I suppose, okay. yes. Yeah. So I was just saying that we kind of broke it up into a few buckets. There was a, let's say, a priority one, uh, which was actually close out that we had actually uh, we got the uh, on the term that we had actually tendered. Sorry, we can't hear you well, Anil. Um, is there someone else who's saying, are you in, hello? Can you hear? Hello. Yeah, we sorry, Anil, we'll, we'll come back to you in a bit. Um, basically, so so we've seen some financial close, um, uh, Aquapower reaching some financial close um, over the past few months as well. So David, may I ask, um, there have been concerns in terms of longer, longer uh, period to reach financial close given the, um, falling uh, credit ratings and um, reduce risk appetite among lenders. Um, is there anything you can tell us about um, about your appetite, risk appetite, given the current situation? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that uh, the, the the banks have always had good appetite for well structured renewable energy projects, and I believe that a track record uh, for lenders has been excellent in the region, uh, reflecting this there were a real need for this source of energy. And uh, I don't think there's been any slowdown from the governments themselves in in, in looking to continue to invest in this particular area. Um, and we have also seen that, um, you know, sort of over the past um, uh, few months since the COVID lockdown, that most of the GCC issuers have tapped to capital markets very successfully to attain general purpose funding. And it's been interesting to see that, um, that, that, that over these past few months, that the pricing of risk in the capital markets has almost returned to pre-COVID COVID levels. And what has been particularly encouraging to see is all these issues substantially oversubscribed and the markets have seen some firsts. And by this I'm referring to the tenors, which have been uh, really achieved in some of the uh, issues where you've seen 30 years, 40 years and 50 years tenors. And this should be a good omen going forward for the project's business, I believe. However, going back to the banks, I mean, I can understand that some of the banks in general uh, may have um, issues in terms of um, liquidity or constraints in terms of market appetite. 
this is a time when ECAs such as ourselves can, can step up to the plate because we're there for the stormy weather as, we're, as well as the fair weather. And whilst we may not it, it, it totally finance a particular project, we believe that the tranches of financing that we can bring through um, uh, to, to bankable transactions where we can bring commercially attractive terms at competitive financing, and even in some cases, direct lending, that this will, will help uh, in, in, in an order to um, bring a, a new element to the market because up until now the ECAs have not been uh, very actively involved in, in particularly the renewable side. But we as a as an export credit agency have very much a focus on renewable energy and clean growth. Sure, sure. Well, thanks for that, David. Um, before I go to Zamil and Peter, um, there is a very good question from, from the audience. Um, um, given anyone can answer, but I would suppose John and Russell might want to say something. Given the output prices and John's statement that are currently in the market, do we accept that Chinese supply chain is the only supply chain? Um, um, uh, for the for the panelists, please uh -huh. please um, mute your 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 speaker if you, so so we can have a better audio if you're not speaking. Who wants to take that question? Um, John. Russell? Well, well, perhaps if I, if I kick off and, and then I'll add another question for John in, in, into that. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I, I don't think that the, there's, obviously that there's good equipment um, coming out of, of, of China, but, but I, I think you still have competition, um, competition for, for, from, from Europe, the US and, and, and Korea for uh, India as well for for for, um, for 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 lots of equipment. So I so I don't think there's any monopoly on supply. Um, I, I I think if if I just broaden the question, and and essentially, and, and a lot of the sort of consultants, advisors, accounting firms, etc., have put out sort of um, statements about sort of infrastructure spending being what one of the sort of key ways to get out of the any sort of recessionary effects from 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 Corona, I, I think they're all pretty much promoting um, more infrastructure spending. At, at, at the same time, um, the, the you know the whole supply chain is is sort of hungry for work. Um, interest rates are at a sort of record low levels, and, and I'm just curious, but particularly from John, perhaps from Zamil as well, if if on the client side. That that's actually sort of revving up uh, uh, any sort of accelerations in in your sort of uh, project program. Oh, we can't hear you, John. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, we can. Um, so the first your question, Russell. Um, no necessarily accelerating uh, but we what we're doing is maybe looking at uh, the existing projects of doing refinancing of existing projects uh, and also not not just conventional refis but bond, you know bond possible applications um, it, Lowering of prices is, uh, is is good to see, but if the demand isn't there, we would not proceed. So the, the first criteria for us is the demand there uh, to uh, that we need to support to ensure that we can maintain our first of all security of supply, and uh, and, and that's why we we would not we're not accelerating our program because of continuing lower capital costs and lower interest rates. As regards Chinese supply, I think, uh, I think most people are, are aware that for the PV market, the Chinese market is extremely aggressive, but we do not preclude anybody from bidding and we, we focus on ensuring that the projects are deliverable and uh, uh, and not just 
in terms of a, a low price, but for the long term of the, pro the projects that we enter into, you know, we're talking 25, 30 year terms that we're, we're, we're contracting for these projects. Sure, sure. And as a segue to our next, in terms of contracts, uh, contractual framework, Zamil, um, I'm going to ask you now, um, does it feel like it's the best of times and the worst of times in terms of um, going ahead with your planned multi-utilities package in Kidea? Uh, well, uh, uh, speaking of the uh, contractual frame, uh, framework, first of all, I think we all agree about uh, how the existing uh, legislations uh, should be uh, flexible to adopt uh, any uh, new uh, approaches or innovative approaches in terms of uh, contractual uh, framework uh, and agreements. Uh, uh, to support uh, this, I mean, uh, as my colleagues have uh, mentioned, that we have, we have now uh, a, a higher appetite from developers uh, to to uh, carry out uh, such uh, privatization projects, uh, given the current uh, low prices that and low financing prices that will support uh, this endeavor. However, uh, it's it's uh, it's paramount that that these uh, new framework can fit. Uh, properly with the uh, uh, current legislations and with, with sure. the absence, sometimes absence of, of uh, legislations that will allow adopting new approaches or innovative approaches can uh, uh, hinder the, uh, the, the rapid growth of, of mm -hmm. this uh, sector and this uh, approach of, uh, of agreements. Right, so there's there's some element of uncertainty because unlike in a government utility where you have a tried and tested model uh, for you being a private private um, real estate company uh, backed by PIF, um, I think there's some challenge. It's a greenfield development. I would suppose there's some uncertainty in terms of demand, um, unpredictability in terms of demand, and there's rapid um, um, technology developments as well. So I think those are, are key things that, that we, you, you will have to take consideration um, going forward. Um, I'll get back to you in a second, Zamil. Pete, um, I understand um, you, you've just mentioned that your contract lasts until 2040. Um, we also know that some of the IPPs and IWPPs in the region are reaching the end of their um, concession period. Um, are there, is there a room to improve the current um, contractual framework that governs the relationship between off-takers and operators like yourself and, and developers and, 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 and in order to ensure a smoother transition towards the end of, of, of the contract? I, I think that certainly for, for the, the contract that, that I'm involved in, it's quite clear in the concession agreement that the, the operator and the asset owner have to hand back the, the facilities in a particular, particular condition. And I think um, certainly it would be normal to ensure there's, there's five years of operational life in the assets at the handbag period. I mean, there's, there's a lot of large clause in contracts that, that relate to handbag condition. Um, now, it's obviously the government ha will have a choice at that time whether it wants to um, enter into another agreement with the existing operator or the existing concessioner or whether it takes ownership of the assets at that time. I mean, uh, for us, uh, 2040 is quite a long, long way away. And certainly I, I will be <laughs> here in 2040 in terms of this project. But I think it's very contract specific. But obviously I'm mindful. Um, we're now at year seven in this contract. I'm mindful of capital replacement. And we're starting to enter a phase of capital replacement refurbishment on the assets that we have uh, as part of this scheme. Um, it's, it's my job to ensure that um, the assets are maintained for the duration of the concession because the, um, the penalty risk on the operator is, is, tends to be um, such, of such significance that I can't afford to sweat the assets and allow them to become um, worn or um, ineffective. So one of the biggest things for an operator is ensuring they understand their capital refurbishment program well, such that they can assess the condition of their assets through the duration of the concession. So looking at the asset condition, the asset performance, 
and then adequately assessing the risk to the revenue stream and the services to be delivered to the client and making sure that the refurbishment and replacement they undertake on the asset base is going to ensure the delivery of the services in both the short and the long term. And obviously it's, it's typical for um, both asset owners and, and, and the government client to be happy with the capital program that is being delivered by the operator. And that, that for our scheme, that's, that's reviewed every single year. So because of the amount of data that clients tend to get, the client knows the condition of the assets on a continual basis. And therefore, if the, if the client's got a concern about asset deterioration, then he can raise it well before the handover period. Uh, and it, but it has protection under the handover uh, aspect of the contract anyway. And is that, that and are you describing an actual sort of process or is that something that is ideal um, in terms of the transparency? Well, for, for this particular scheme, I mean, we, every year we have to submit a maintenance and rehabilitation plan. So I have to tell the asset owner and the ultimate plan, the government, what maintenance is going to be carried out, plan maintenance in the forthcoming year. And they have to accept that plan. So they know what maintenance is carried out on the assets. Within there will be capital maintenance. It will say, look, this is the condition of the asset now. And to ensure um, the longevity of service, we need to refurbish this asset to ensure it performs and therefore every every year the client the asset owner and the um the government will see what work has been carried out on the assets that deliver in the service that they're paying for right right and um, let me go sorry sorry to interrupt you peter go ahead so i'm, I'm just saying this is the second pfi scheme i'll be involved in one was in the uk and one's here and to be honest in the uk the the schemes are very very similar so a PFI and a wastewater uh, a scheme in UK, there was very little, little difference between between what the operators required to do in terms of capital maintenance and asset management, uh, as I have to do here. So they're very similar. Right, right. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, Anil, um, so so maybe you can share. Well, it's still I'm not sure if there's any specific asset under Aqua Power that's now um, coming out of contract. But um, can you share, can you give us some insight in terms of the process um, of uh, what options are, are, be, are on the table when it comes to um, web, whether you transfer the asset back to the government, whether you expand or renegotiate um, with a view to extending the power purchase agreement or to dismantle the, the, the asset at the end of its um, concession. Uh, yeah, thanks. Is this a bit better, by the way? Can you hear us? Yes, yes. Yes, Anil. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. And um, there are definitely a number of assets which have come to the end of the concession period or are in various stages uh, of, let's say, getting to that final phases of the concession uh, for uh, Akupower. And this is definitely something that uh, we have been looking at uh, very carefully in the last few years. And I think this is going to be a, let's say, a market, a different analysis, let's say, by different markets, uh, the kind of technologies that we are talking about and where that would fit into each grid, etc. So I guess it's a, each procurer, each uh, developer or each project is going to look at it slightly differently. Uh, but there is definitely because a lot of these projects were uh, tendered definitely on the assumption that these a lot of these are this part of the world are BOO projects and uh, there is a very clear assumption of extensions or uh, could potentially repowerings. Uh, there is a very clear understanding that this is a much more longer term arrangement than what is the baseline concession uh, and it is to us it is a kind of a exercise what that means is uh, you know depending on the specific for example you might end up with uh, let's say oil fired assets which clearly might not fit into the larger scheme of things in 2020 or in 2030 compared to what what, what was the story let's say in 2000 right uh, however it kind of fits into a larger story and it's a question of kind of working with the procurers and working with the market counterparties to see uh, you know how do you end up to a situation that's a win-win for all parties Right, so it's I, I suppose it's a very tricky um, situation. But why is it that there seems to be a, com, uh, a perception that transfer BOOT 
is, is falling out of favor with, with clients? Is it because, again, because of the rapid uh, uh, advances in technology or the shift perhaps to decoupling power and water production? Is, 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 is that true that, that BOOT is not really preferred um, in this region? Um, John, can, can you comment? John, you are on mute, I, I think. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, we, we can agree that uh, that is not uh, the preferred solution. Uh, and uh, we, we would prefer to be able to negotiate as we, uh, as the end of term approaches for a potential extension. And of course, uh, this is uh, ongoing at the moment with some of our, our older assets. Can't hear you, Jennifer. You're muted, Jenny. Sorry. Yeah. So I, I will be going to use Emil in a moment, but there's there's an interesting question here, and I'll give you the context. PP, PPAs turned out to be very burdensome for many countries. Um, revenues put pressure on countries' budget. Some countries outside the GCC already tried to renegotiate PPA terms. But what are the major, I think the question is, what are the major evolutions in respect to PPP framework or terms? What areas need to be changed um, in terms of the um, financing scheme and more flexible PPA terms? Is, is, is anyone um, willing to take that question on? Um, well, well, perhaps, uh, if you don't mind, I'd say, say I, I, I guess um, when um, the, the, the sort of PPP model sort of kicked off um, in, in, in the Middle East, which is probably longer than 15 years ago, but, but, but I think our earliest projects um, were in o Oman and probably Oman had the most standard format for, for, for projects. Um, but projects were difficult to bid and, and they typically took sort of six months. Um, and, 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 but now the framework has pretty much become very standard. Um, the, the clients, uh, the client organizations have got very smart. The advisors have, have got very smart. There's a number of projects have been procured successfully. And, and, and there has been an evolution um, so, so that now even, even major projects um, are, are procured very quickly with, with, with a sort of minimum of fuss uh, and a sort of an, very much an excellent all-round understanding for, from, from clients, developers, advisors and, and lenders. Um, certainly the, um, the early stages of, of that can be a, a little painful um, but but now a, a, across some of the sectors I mean I mean particularly the the desal sector that or the power and, and the water sector um, the 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 GCC probably has uh, you know it's, it's got the majority of the world's plants it's got the majority of, of projects procured un, under this model um, and, and 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 it's an evolution, but but there is a, a sort of a, a model that other other countries um, could could do well to take from. So, uh, John, do you have any thoughts in terms of, of this question from from our audience? Yes, so it, it's business as usual. We 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 always look at the financing scheme as you know uh, we we take uh, interest rate risk and we also keep ourselves very closely monitoring what the financing markets are up to and uh, have adjusted uh, our RFPs to acknowledge those changes through the good times 10-15 years ago through the, the major recession through six years ago to what the market is willing to accept. You know, commercial lenders are not very keen on long-term financing. They want to see a way out in maybe five years, hopefully. So we, we look at uh, 
mini perm solutions. We, we, we even um, are thinking maybe in the future of the funds uh, as right. that, that market is becoming more liquid and more aggressive, mm -hmm. prepared to think of when to enter these PPP projects. So, um, yeah, we're right. flexible. And the, the, the main thing we're looking at uh, for new projects is because we know we have extensive programs that we, we will be considering, like other countries like Saudi, uh, in country value. Right. Uh, and uh, trying to, um, uh, to, to uh, progress that in terms of attracting in-country manufacturer as well. So we're thinking about that and how we uh, cause that to, to be considered seriously within our RFP, RFPs in the future. So, 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 so the next projects will, will, would you say the next RO or the next PV will, similar to what we see in Repdo in Saudi Arabia, would already have ICB requirements in it or? Is that something that's still in the very initial stages? It's, it's still under debate because, uh, you know, uh, we, we have to consider the, the, the issue from both sides of the equation. Sure. Um, and Zamil, um, we're just talking about contracts. So the, for Kidea, there will be one, there will be one developer and presumably several partners that will operate, um, develop and operate the power I'm not sure if it's renewable energy is, is the plan, um, our water, wastewater as well, um, and, and the net networks that connect them. Um, I would suppose this is a daunting set of documents that you will have to sign. And, and how prepared are you uh, in terms of, um, I mean, it might be a hypothetical question, but it is, it is going to be a very comprehensive contract you're about to sign. Definitely, uh, and, and that's due to having uh, a very complex uh, uh, sort of utilities to be supplied. It's uh, the, because it's it's bundled in, in one agreement to, to supply uh, power, including renewable uh, energy, uh, potable water, wastewater treatment, uh, irrigation water, ICT uh, connectivity and facilities, uh, in addition to municipal uh, solid waste. Uh, that that all to be uh, part of the agreement in addition to the network uh, reaching out to each uh, individual end users uh, within that uh, geographic uh, area to be able to uh, invoice the uh, uh, the end users which is uh, i think it's it's maybe a precedent uh, in, in the market it's uh, it's something uh, new to be, to be developed and that's why it's uh, very complex uh, and the driver for uh, for such approach is to uh, to for uh, to enable the uh, uh, as you know in in the uh, the new development in in Saudi Arabia for example the giga projects are uh, based on developing uh, very large uh, uh, very large areas uh, that are green fields uh, to be developed completely new for uh, heavy heavy development in the future so bringing the the know-how right. uh, of sure. the of the uh, developers sure. will will help to accelerate uh, executing these projects and operating them uh, properly sure. during the concession period sure um pete do you have any 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 thoughts in terms of how complex um this could how how to make this work and how complex it might be um can you be more, be more specific uh, jennifer I don't quite follow. No, sorry, I, I'm just thinking. What are your thoughts in terms of the complexity of such um, um, the the approach that Kidia is planning to approach, having <laughs> one operator or maybe several operators uh, yeah. for multiple utilities? Yeah, it, it's feasible. I, th I think one thing that, that would come to mind um, would, would would be not only um, clients' management of of, of, it, of its co contractor, but also the regulation that applies. I mean, one thing that's slowly coming into into, into play in, in GCC 
is utility regulation. I mean, it's, it's no greater than in Bahrain, yeah, but there's some across the UAE, I know. And that, I think, is very important in this market because it, as long as you've got a long-term vision from a government in terms of where it wants its utility structure to go to, then I think it makes it easier for somebody to operate in that market. If you've got governments taking short-term decisions, it means it's difficult for operator to plan and think about a future, and also it increases the price. And I think if you get, if you move towards some sort of independent regulation of utilities, electricity, water, gas, telecoms, etc., then I think, and, and, it, and that regulation is as unaffected as possible. Um, so the government sets out the long-term vision and lets the regulator regulate the, the industry. But I think it's going to be easy for the op the operators to enter that market because they've got some degree of certainty of what the medium term picture is going to be, and that I think is, is is even more important when you're looking at something like the Zamil scheme because you're talking about a lot of different utilities that may the moment be regulated slightly different ways, and therefore the operator has a different has to dance with a different tune depending who he's talking to. And that's where I think that's where I think uh, central government is important in, in, in leading that in terms of long term visions for regulation of those those deliverables, if you like. Right. Absolutely. Um, I think that's a very good uh, um, uh, um, um, idea, uh, set of thoughts from, from Pete. And Neil, um, you're about to sign. Well, uh, we know that uh, Aquapower was the preferred uh, bidder for the Red Sea multi-utilities package. Um, I'm not sure if you were involved in that project, but um, um, so Aquapower bid alone for, for the project and you're now in the process of being um, partners and it, it, it will be an interesting project for your portfolio, I would suppose. Mm, that is indeed correct. So we're one of the uh, bidders and we are the preferred bidder for uh, the Red Sea uh, program. And of course, you know, we are one of the bidders for Zamil's program as well, for the Kidia program as well. Uh, and yes, we definitely see that, especially for the Saudi market, we see that as, uh, let us say, as something that's forward looking, that's the way a lot of procurement is going to happen in the kingdom in the next few years, especially, for example, as Neom uh, develops uh, and a number of the other economic cities, etc., kind of come online. We think that this is... Uh, this is one uh, very significant step forward because this kind of uh, consolidate and ensures that uh, a lot of these new developments can take into account the absolute, uh, let us say, best practices in terms of ensuring sustainability goals, ESG goals, uh, you know, renewable targets, etc., while also ensuring a lot of control in terms of how this is uh, priced and uh, procured. Right. So I think, yeah, I think, um, as, as Pete said, I think the, the remaining sort of um, cloud, I would suppose, is, is regulations in terms of um, um, uh, having regulations in place and how clear they are and how it will apply to, to the contracts. And there's another interesting question with PPAs coming to an end. This is spot market. Uh, and for a spot market, I know that Oman, um, we don't have anyone from Oman in the panel, but Oman is planning a spot market and what are your thoughts it's is 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 it a good time to to introduce um to bring spot markets into the picture and um, anyone in the so, panel when you say spot markets generous you, you mean actually um the, the the clients sort of putting those projects out to bid for for, for people to buy and Wholesale. upgrade yes yeah so 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 the off taker uh, uh -huh. also becomes the marketplace operator um i think in some markets right. i think that's 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 the model uh -huh. and then though and, and then those capacities that are out of contract can then sell um to the spot market um is that a model that could that, that could work john john you're yeah, I was just uh, thinking how to respond to that because it's uh, a complex. Uh, uh, you can't just suddenly switch off a, a long-term contract without implications, and how uh, how how uh, you you can suddenly change to a spot market. And I think we all know Oman has been looking to do this for quite some time. And, 
have still not come up with a solution for themselves yet. Um, difficult, very difficult and not easy to do. I guess from from a sort of a contractor's perspective, I mean, for, for example, Peter, where, where somebody uh, you, you have an incumbent sort of operator who, who sort of knows the plant, um, it, it's quite feasible for them for them to actually sort of sort of um, price you know price the project and and, and put a, a a bid together. Um, certainly, certainly, sort of. Pricing up brownfield projects is can be quite complex, um, and even if it were possible ac across different industries, w w whether it's sort of um, uh, on a desal or or or, or solar or uh, power, I, I think there's very different levels of sort of technical obsolescence across the different industries. Where, whereas, probably on, on the on the water side, it's probably better to sort of tear down and start again. Where, where perhaps on on the wastewater side, uh, you you could actually sort of fix it up um, and just just find the efficiencies sort of where where you can. So was that a question to me? I think we've. I think we've lost. Um, oh, Jenny, you're muted. And we're down to the last minutes of uh, last five minutes of of of, of the session. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask um, uh, a question in terms of um, um, there's there's a growing a uh, trend towards sale of assets in 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 the region. So you have Kuwait and Saudi Arabia planning to privatize um, some of their um, power and water. And is there's an opportunity or are are I, is this is this a good? It's probably not the best time to do it. You think? Okay, anyone can can. Um, <laughs> I know it's a bit controversial, but Anil, um, uh -huh. do you have anything to say in terms uh, of this uh, privatization of of power and water plants in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait? Um, see, we we don't really think from that because it makes strategic sense uh, for the entities that are doing it. Uh, of course, you know, whether that kind of fits into the plans of the developers, whether there's enough liquidity out there, of course, questions that will get answered as we go forward. And these are procurers that are flexible enough to react based on, you know, how the market reacts. So uh, we do think that that's definitely if that fits into their framework and into their, you know, uh, Akova, for example, as an entity, will definitely be there, uh, will uh, consider each project on its own merits and uh, will try to figure out solutions uh, to deliver to the procurers. Right. And, and if David, uh, thank uh, Sorry to interrupt. Uh, if I can just add yes. to that, uh, Jenny, um, I, I, would, I wouldn't be speaking on behalf of our, uh, the National uh, Privatization Center or the uh, is WPCC, uh, but uh, one, one of the uh, strategies that they are putting on, on the table uh, on, on to to explain why uh, the, the government is, is going with this approach is to uh, increase the competitiveness uh, at this sector and therefore increase the efficiency of the outcome of, of these projects. And this is uh, one of the main goals of, of why the government will be headed heading uh, toward this uh, approach in the, in the coming future. Right. Right. Well, well thank you very much, David. Um, my last question, perhaps, um, given given the, the, the general weight and see uh, um, stance in terms of uh, procuring new projects um, and therefore needing financing, um, do, you, do you think there, there's enough in the pipeline going forward or has that been weakened by, by the recent low oil prices? And if yes, um, are you looking at refinancing as being the key opportunity and, and do you have services um, for, in terms of those kind of transactions? 
Okay, to, thank you, Jennifer. To answer your first question, uh, uh, your last point first, uh, we're, we're interested in obviously um, promoting exports and content into, into projects. So um, we wouldn't take part in necessarily a refinancing as such. Um, if there was to be um, a, an expansion involved, then we could get involved in the, the financing that we're being attached to that. In terms of pipeline, I mean, I think that uh, we see that there has been, um, you know, I mean, one of one of the the impacts of uh, of COVID, um, and and more particularly the, the drop in oil prices, that there were substantial uh, capital expenditure plans in place by all governments, and whilst they have been cut back, by comparison with any other markets, these are still very substantial. And we think that you know, this particular area where you're looking at renewables and, and water and wastewater uh, projects, we still see a good flow, a good pipeline. And, uh, and I think that um, you know, the, 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 the final point I would make is that um, you know, I've heard my colleagues on the panel sort of speaking about reducing uh, uncertainties and, and, and being able to effectively manage risk. I mean, the fact is that the ECAs are here and uh, we ourselves in particular as UK export finance have got appetite to do direct lending into uh, into the um, into these projects and, um, and when it's direct lending this is the government the UK government putting its own funds in on fixed rates for long long tenors and we believe that this this form of financing can sit very easily alongside what the commercial banks are doing and complement what they're doing and, and help them at a time when um, the, 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 there's a, is a player that can bring that kind of advantage to, to whatever they're doing. And when you look at the, the benefits of that long-term financing at, at what are no historically low interest rates, the impact on the tariff uh, over, over the period of time is enormous. Right. And there's one more, sorry, and there's one more question. Um, maybe we have time for it. Uh, maybe John or anyone in the panel or Peter maybe. Um, how does the nationalization programs work within these agreements in the delivery phase? I mean, if there's there's an objective for an increased um, content or, or, or localization, is, um, is, is that factored in when you sign the agreement today? Um, how, how does that work? It is. Uh, on that one. Sorry, John, if you want to go in, but go ahead. After you, Peter. I'll, I'll go after um, you. With, within our contract, there's a requirement to follow the, the relevant legislation to, to, to nationalisation, and we have um, we have about 30% of our staff are, are, are Bahraini, and, and um, I have no issue with that whatsoever. And one of the things I think, um, as somebody coming towards the end of his career, what I'd like to do is pass on my knowledge to, to all of my team for where, from wherever they're from to ensure they make the best of the, the skills they've got and to me I don't mind where they come from and, and as long as you can as long as people can can um, have the ability to develop in the industry that they're working in then um, it, it, I haven't got an issue you know I think it's for people to invest in in the, in the country that they're in or the country that, that they, they're from uh, and um, it's clear that you've got to deliver the services to your clients and as long as you get that message across the people who are working for you from wherever they're from then uh, that's fine I don't should it shouldn't be a hindrance to, to the way the company delivers its services and operates um, wherever so yeah I'm all for it no problem right any thoughts John oh, uh, yes I'm just checking out uh, I was on the uh, speaker uh, Yes, we, we do have um, requirements uh, during the uh, post COD phase of our, our projects in terms of uh, proportion percentage of uh, uh, nationals that should be working uh, with respect to the operation and maintenance of the projects. And that, that escalates over time. We also uh, define the level of training uh, that is to be provided to encourage those tar targets and that the people who are brought in uh, are effective and uh, can grow and uh, you see nowadays most most of the CEOs of our projects are nationals right well well thank you very oh, much gentlemen yeah. thank 
Sorry, Peter. Sorry, just, just, I just want to add no. one last thing. I mean, one of the things that operators do need to be careful of is often is, is restrictions on transfer of current employees. And that can sometimes be a problem where if you're, for example, taking on an existing asset or you're starting a new asset and you're looking for staff within the region who are, not, who are local, one challenge can be that you're not allowed to procure them from the existing utility provider. You have to train them yourself. And I, I go along with John's point there, training is very, very important. But that can be a challenge to an operator because you can't take the staff you'd like because they're already working for the government utility and they're not allowed to transfer. So that can be sometimes an issue that you have to be, be wary of. But you get guys from wherever you can get them from and you train them, simple as that. Amazing. Um, I mean, I think that's all we have time for. I know that the entire the, the topics that we tried to discuss today could uh, amount to a, a full day's event in terms of um, um, further discussions and debates. But thank you all very much. Um, thank you, John Franklin Hurst, Capacity Procurement Director, Emirates Water and Electricity Company. Um, thank you, David Malter, Senior Counselor, uh, UK Export Finance. Um, Pete Naylor, thank you very much for joining us from Bahrain Operators Representative and General Manager, Muharraq Wastewater Services Company. Russell Reed, um, thank you, General Manager, Industrial and Environment Division of Samsung Engineering. Um, okay. Zamil, uh, Al Zamil, thank you very much, Director for Interface Management. And Anil um, Vichayan, Vichaya, Chandran, Director Acquisitions and Project Finance of Aquapower, sorry. Um, but it has been a terrific um, uh, um, session, it's been a terrific uh, exchange of thoughts and information. And thank you to our audience for, for staying until the last minute. We've got uh, nearly 200 um, um, attendees. And sorry for those questions that we were not able to answer. I will try to furnish the questions to the right um, panelists and then um, provide some answers offline. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Okay.